Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 122, Where We're Headed. And in this episode, I would actually like to just talk a little bit about the break that I've had for the past several months. And I want to talk about an old and a new habit of something that I've wanted to start up again and really enjoy doing. Talk a little bit about the Enneagram and some things I've learned about it this summer, about myself and how that relates and then to share with you where I hope to take the Unbinding the Bible podcast in the weeks and months to come. So I'm really excited just to introduce us back into thinking about these sorts of things and spend a little time talking about my life and what God's been doing in and through me, and then to launch us in a forward direction about where we'll be able to go as we move forward. So let's just get right into it. thought it would be a good idea to start this new episode by just thanking several of you who reached out to me either on Facebook Messenger or through the Unbinding the Bible at Gmail um, email account and just let me know when I took a break in June that you were praying for me, you were thankful for the podcast and were praying that I would find a lot of rest. And um, I really, really appreciate that. And that is actually exactly what's happened. Um, These three and a half months have been incredibly restful. Um, I thought about the podcast once or twice at the beginning, and then I just put it out of my mind entirely. And I realized looking back how many weeks I had done it and my body and mind and soul and spirit just needed a rest. And that's really exactly what I got. So all summer long, it was great. Spent a lot of time with our family, things at our church are plenty busy, and this really did give me time to devote to other things. And um, But as I looked at the calendar, as I thought about the start date of this podcast being September 20th of 2018, I thought, you know, sometime around September again might be a great day to relaunch. Um, I heard through the grapevine that this is International Podcast Day, September the 30th, and so I thought, what a great day to start my podcast up again. And so as I've been pondering over the summer, while I didn't think a lot about doing the podcast, Revelation was, it took a lot out of me. That was a, that was a big effort on my part and um, to, to just really dig down and to be committed to doing it week in and week out. And I'm not sure at this point that on the podcast, I'm going to do something quite that big in terms of an undertaking. Um, Revelation kind of seem to take over. And that's a good thing. It's supposed to take over in our lives and reshape us around the person of Jesus. But committing myself to something that ended up being 80 plus um, episodes is not something that I envision happening in the future, but who knows? I didn't think revelation would happen when I started unbinding the Bible and 38 weeks into it, that changed. So we'll see what happens. Only God knows. And uh, if you've got any great ideas of things, I'm always open to suggestions, although I do have a few few directions I'd like to take it in. But one of the things I pondered this summer when I was just resting and just thinking and just chewing on things was how life-giving it is for me to just be open and real and honest with people. And one of the things that I'm noticing is how little I used to do that in my own life and how seldom that actually still happens in the lives of other people. And it's nothing profound. It's not that I'm asking people to divulge their deepest, darkest secrets, but I just love being real with people and just being open with them. And I know that on this podcast, sometimes I get personal, but sometimes I don't. And I um, just kind of dive right into the passage at hand and we talk about that, um, which is good. But I wanted to share a little bit about me. And I've been thinking about it from a pastoral side. How can I just talk to you all listeners about the Bible and about your walk with Christ, but use myself as an example if necessary, or just talk about life, things that we like, things that we don't like, and the value that we bring and the color that we bring to to life um, in our relationships. And so something I just wanted to bring up was the fact that I enjoy dabbling in the area of running. Um, I have, I've been a runner, I guess, in a sense, since I was a little kid, my dad and I used to run races together. I think the very first one I ever ran was when I was six, and I loved it. Um, there is just something about your feet connecting with the ground, being out in nature. Running is one of those things for me that is entirely therapeutic. Um, I love to run. 
just for the feeling of running. And I laugh because I talk to my wife or other friends that I have, people who just hate it. I mean, you couldn't pay them money to, to be a runner and maybe that's you and that's fine. But for me, I would and actually have paid other people to allow me to run in various road races. I've done one half marathon, one full marathon. Um, I ran cross country and track in high school and a couple years in college. But since then have only kind of dabbled in it. And um, the dabbling I've done in it in recent years has led me to run, you know, a couple times a week maybe, or once or, you know, five times a month, or then I'll skip a couple years and I won't run. But in the last several weeks, I've kind of gotten the itch for it again. And one of the rules in running, and you may not know, but if you're attempting to train or you're attempting to get into shape, you need to log quite a few miles. That's just what you need to do. And one of the rules of thumb is as you're increasing your mileage from week to week, never increase from one week's mileage more than 10% of that total into your next week. So if I'm running 10 miles a week, one week, and I want to increase my running, I shouldn't go out and try to run 15 or 20 miles the next week. I should bump it up 10%, which simply enough would be 11 miles the next week. And then after that, it would be 1.1 more. So it'd be 12.1. And, you know, you don't have to get too technical at the point ones, but the idea being that you just increase by a little. And um, I had been averaging maybe 12, 11 or 12 miles a week over 2021 and got the itch for running several weeks ago and went out and picked it up and four miles here, five miles there, six miles. And then I found myself getting comfortable with a route of six miles a day and I did it for four out of five days. And so in a week's time, I went from running 11 or 12 miles a week to running almost 30 and um, I got hurt. Super discouraging. I'm not as young as I once was. So I've been icing my legs and taking Epsom salt baths and stretching and doing all kinds of silly things, but I've got this burning desire to run another half marathon. So I'm going to hopefully start some training in that soon, but I'm going to have to take things slowly because that's where I am in life. And it's, it's kind of frustrating. I'm still feeling it a little bit in the soreness, but I'm hoping to build something up and I just kind of keep you all updated about how that's going. Uh, Maybe that doesn't interest you or what, but it's something that's really important to me. I'm excited about it. I'm hopeful just to be able to get out and get in shape and work on good form and good posture and healthy eating and um, just seeing what the body that God made to love running, what, what I could actually do if I was fully invested. And so I'm, I'm just excited for that. And I also, this summer with my wife, we have been really studying the Enneagram. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Enneagram, but it's a one of several uh, different personality profiles more or less. Um, Many people are familiar with the Myers-Briggs, the INFP or the INTJ or the ESTP and things like that and looking at various characteristics that describe who we are as people. And I know some of my friends and family members even don't love the Enneagram or, or personality tests. They think they're too constrictive and Funny enough, that's also a personality. Um, it's, it's things that don't like to be put into boxes. But the Enneagram is really powerful, I think, because it it identifies motivations behind certain actions. And it more or less helps to pull the veil back of showing us what some of our coping mechanisms have become over the course of our lives as a result of childhood upbringing circumstances that have happened in our lives, ways that we have sought to manage the information that has come into our world and the way we tend to relate with it. And for several years now, as I've read the Enneagram and tried to diagnose myself, I've lived a large portion of my life fairly oblivious to who I was as a person. And I think I shared at least once or twice on the podcast, I know I did in the honor interview with Dan Kent on his book, Confident Humility. But I actually shared with Dan on that podcast that until several years ago, I didn't even like myself. Like I was very keenly aware of lots of negative characteristics of my personality, ways in which I had been blind to who I was. 
but as a result participated in actions and had treated people with certain um, uh, ways of being myself that I was not proud of. And a large reason why that was the case was that I didn't really know what was going on under the surface. I I didn't know how to analyze my own motives. I, I wasn't aware of the fears that were controlling my life and the ways that I would manipulate people under the surface and defined humility as just letting people do what, you know, lo- loving another and letting them have their own way in your life and not asserting yourself. I-, I used to define being assertive as a controlling, manipulative tactic and have actually accused people who are assertive in healthy ways of being domineering because that's how I used to internalize that. And I know you're not tuning into Unbinding the Bible in order to listen to me rant and rave um, in a counseling session with you about all of my issues and struggles. But I do feel it's important to bring this up to you anyway. Number one, because I have nothing to hide. I'm not here to promote myself as an expert in anything and someone that you should aspire to become like. I'd much rather confess to you my weaknesses so that we can enter into relationship and the Christian life together and know that when we express our weaknesses and our need for Jesus' um, grace to strengthen us, then we open ourselves up to that possibility. And I think that's what the church should be, is a place where we are all free to express our true selves. And so my wife and I have been studying the Enneagram, and I used to think I was a four, and I had kind of identified with that, some of the feeling center. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big feeler, and without going into all the the details, I, I've come to realize through several <laughs> circumstances and events that I think I'm actually a nine in the Enneagram. And when I first encountered that, that the nine is sometimes categorized as the peacemaker, um, the nine who has an ability to, um, to see the perspectives of all the other numbers on the Enneagram. And yet one of the nine's challenges is that the nine is able to empathize. They are able to enter into the world of another person. But sometimes when the nine is not healthy in that role, they tend to do what many Enneagram um, authors will call merging. And that is they will end up or I will end up so associating with this other person's perspective that I lose sight of my own perspective and I just become one with theirs. And so the nines in an unhealthy state are people who feel like they are able to understand and appreciate and love everyone, but they lose themselves in the process because they no longer know where they end and another person begins. And when I began to lean into that a little bit, I realized, oh my goodness, this is exactly who I am. This is exactly the difficulties that I've experienced in my own life. And I had a friend who listens to this podcast regularly, shout out to you, Corey, um, who listens very faithfully. Corey's been on the podcast before during some of our interview sessions, one in the middle of Revelation and one way back at the beginning. Um of the podcast where we just did a little Q&A about the first several episodes. And Corey also loves the Enneagram and, and knows lots more about it than I do. So he's a great conversation partner in this regard. But he, he heard me say that he, he knew I used to think I was a four. And then when I told him that I was a nine, he said, this is really interesting. He said, your podcast, for instance, then a, a, as a four, I used to think that a four for you, Josh, meant that your podcast was your unique contribution to the world. You know, fours have this inner motivation that they want to see themselves or they want to believe themselves to be unique. Like nobody quite gets the four. Uh, the four is is different than everybody else. And that's important to the four is to be someone who is unique and different. And so Corey said, when you used to say you were a four, I would say, wow, then his podcast is his unique contribution to the world of biblical scholarship or to the world of, you know, church life and things like this. And he says, but now that you're calling yourself a nine, maybe your podcast is your attempt to find your voice. And he said, and this is you working out your thoughts with listeners who can offer you feedback for you to be able to find the voice that is uniquely yours. 
And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not sure how you all receive Unbinding the Bible, how you take it in. But to me, Corey has nailed it with me as a nine. Because that is exactly how I feel and how I view Unbinding the Bible. I am very comfortable when it comes to finding a respected author or a respected voice and quoting that voice as the authority. What I have never been overly comfortable doing is disagreeing with one of those voices, voicing a perspective that maybe not a lot of other people are saying, thinking my way through an issue and arriving at my own conclusion, a conclusion that maybe I've never even heard anybody else say, and have the ability and the willingness to learn how to say that, how to say it with confidence, but how to do it in such a way that if you disagree... I don't receive it as you're rejecting me. I receive it as you are entitled to your own working through of this perspective and need to come to your own conclusion. And I'll tell you, as an unhealthy nine for most of my life, I never knew how to do that. I never knew how to disagree with another person and not get my feelings hurt or not feel like they were rejecting me or not knowing how to say to another person, I understand what you are saying. I see that perspective, but I have a different perspective and I'm not going to agree with you on this. I never knew how to do that unless I was really angry and I just would yell at somebody about it because I felt so trapped in what they were saying. And so for me, I am growing and trying to learn my ability at becoming a healthy nine someone who's able to see things from everybody's perspective, but someone who takes a long time to process information. So as a pastor, I used to carry the weight of assuming that as a leader, I must be the kind of leader that in the moment can just make a decision that needs made and it's going to be the right decision. And over the course of my life, I've carried tremendous guilt around the fact that I can't do that. If you've asked me to make a decision about a matter that means something and you ask me to do it in the next 20 minutes, the decision that I make will be the wrong one. It just will. I, I, I panic. I freeze. I don't have the time to fully gather my thoughts. And so I've been learning to lean in as a pastor of a church. I've begun to assert myself enough to say to people, I need time to process that. I know you want an answer right now, but I can't give you one. And I'm not going to until I've had a chance to process it and to turn around and give it back. Now, that used to frustrate me. In fact, it frustrated me even just a few months ago until another good friend of mine who also listens to the podcast said, you take a long time to process. That's not a weakness. That's why you are a good teacher because you've been able to think through these things for so long And process them for so much time internally that when you finally say something about it, you've thought it all the way through. And that was a huge encouragement to me. I had never thought about it like that. But that's actually been true for the book of Revelation, for instance. You know, for some people, they hear the podcast and they hear, wow, that's new. I've never heard that before. And they imagine that somehow I'm doing that for them. Like I'm giving them something they've never heard. For me, though, I've been chewing on that material for over 10 years. And notice, in the podcast was the very first time I ever said what I thought out loud. I've never preached this. I've never taught this. I never led a Bible study on this. I rarely have conversations about it, except for people that I really, really trust and say, here's just what I'm thinking. You know, what do you think? But to do that on the podcast was courageous for me because it was me trying to find my voice. And that is probably, I could say, why it took me so long to teach the book, because I wasn't sure what I thought about some of the minor points, and I wasn't sure how I felt it all tied together. And I think at some point in the future, all of that work might be able to be synthesized down into something a bit more manageable, maybe 10, 12 episodes or 10, 12 mini chapters in a book or something to that effect. But I'm excited about it because I realize as an information person, when I process slowly, I'm learning that's okay. And I'm learning to set boundaries in place between myself and my desires or my needs to 
go back and recharge after a long, stressful meeting, that's okay. Because I want to lean in fully to who I've been made as God's image bearer, but I've been made uniquely. And I'm very different from my wife. And I'm very different from you who listen to the podcast. And I'm very different from my other really close friends. But it dawned on me a while ago that I'm now, as I've shared with you before, am leading an Anglican and a Lutheran shared ministry. And it's funny to think about myself as a nine, someone who is capable of seeing things from multiple perspectives. It's beginning to dawn on me with more and more clarity that I am actually perfectly suited and perfectly built to do what we're trying to do in our church. Um, It's difficult. I will not lie to you. It's hard. It is hard to manage the feelings and emotions of myself, number one, but also of several people from in the church who get upset that their particular denomination's perspective isn't being valued as much, they feel, as the other one. And I need to be able to allow people to come into my office and vent to me, which has happened on numerous occasions, so that they can be heard and that I can take their perspective into consideration while I process that along with my own perspective to think through the best way to lead and the the best way to make the next step. And I really feel like this is a continual dance. And it's a dance that I have been trying to find the answer to for years. And I've reached out to several people. I'm going to reach out to you and I'm going to explain to you where I currently am. The dance that I'm in at this exact moment centers a lot around personality, and around being able to fully engage other people for the benefit of the gospel. And so really, the, the, the dance that I'm trying to navigate right now, which is going to sort of set us up for where I want to take us in the podcast, is kind of centered around a, several questions, and I've written them down. Let me just read them for you, and then I'll explain to you what I think they mean or what I'm trying to say. What is the relationship between fully knowing yourself and learning to live into the specific person God made you to be and Jesus' call for us to deny ourselves. When do we know we ought to assert ourselves in terms of our strengths and our gifting and when we ought to defer to someone else's desires, wishes, and wants? This to me feels like the dance of the Christian life. How do we come to know ourselves and embrace ourselves and our unique way of being made and therefore unique way of living out our Christian convictions in this world with the fact that Jesus wants us, as he says um, several times in the gospels, right, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And I think I've shared on this podcast way back in the first, maybe the first 20 episodes or so, somewhere in there, I shared how for years, when you don't know yourself and you you don't have good self-awareness, you aren't able to detect motives and fears and anxieties and things that trip you up or the way you internalize information, if you don't know any of that, and you approach Jesus' words of deny yourself, then what we all run the risk of doing is denying potentially aspects of our being that we never should deny. There are aspects of our being that are who we are. And if we deny those things like I used to do, we feel continually like people are just getting to determine what we do. And I have to just go along with it because that's what Jesus would do, right? And then internally, I'm like, increasingly frustrated and increasingly angry and increasingly, why doesn't anybody ever let me have a say in what takes place next? And then I would squelch those desires because I would say, well, to want to do what I want, that should be selfish. And Jesus says, don't be selfish. So then the whole message of the Christian life becomes, don't be selfish, don't be selfish, don't be selfish. And the whole life of a person is, Find who your true self is so you can live out your unique identity between you and Jesus and and in front of the rest of the world for their benefit and for Jesus's honor. If you don't know which is which and you end up denying aspects of your 
fundamental humanity because you think that's what Jesus is asking you to do, then it's going to lead to a complete waste of the giftings that he's given you. And it's going to lead to immense frustration in your own life. Because the fact is the shape that a person's Christian life is going to take on, they will have specific characteristics unique to that individual's personality. And so if you and I know our coping mechanisms or our tendencies, it's going to shine tremendous light on the areas where the Holy Spirit may specifically want to transform us into the image of Christ. People are not all the same. It was so funny to hear Corey say to me, if I was a four, I might have been doing my podcast for this reason. If I'm a nine, I might be doing it for this reason. There are seven other numbers on the Enneagram. Imagine what nine different people all doing a podcast, trying to unbind the Bible from the many ways it's been misread and misapplied. Imagine the different ways that would be done by nine different people. And you would ask which one of those people is doing it the right way. And that's the wrong question. It's not the right way. It's which is the way they've been designed to do it. And that's all I can offer you on Unbinding the Bible. All you are getting is Joshua Yoder's nine perspective on the world. That's it. That's all you're getting. And it's unique and it's important, but it's just one of of an infinite number of possibilities that we could all receive because we're not all the same. And therefore, the way we express our faithfulness to Christ will not look the same as someone else's. It will take a specific shape. It will take a specific form. And this is really the direction that I want to take with unbinding the Bible. I don't want to keep it incredibly personal. I want us to lean into this idea of shape. And I'm going to steal Michael Gorman's words, uh, many of which I've probably already read to you. But Michael Gorman, I had on the podcast um, to talk about his book, Reading Revelation Responsibly. And Michael Gorman, in addition to that book, has written lots about what he calls a cruciform identity. And that is um, cruciform or in the shape of the cross. And a statement that Gorman made on that interview we had with Reading Revelation Responsibly is that Jesus is both the source as well as the shape of our salvation. And so what he meant by that was we all know that the cross and Jesus on the cross is the source of our salvation. It's where, how our sins are forgiven. It is how we are reconciled with God. It is how we are made at peace with God and therefore at one another. It is how Jesus has destroyed the principalities and powers, removed them from this world and ushered us into new life. But the way Paul writes in the New Testament is that that reality, that cross-shaped reality, cross-source of salvation is also the shape of our salvation. Meaning it's the essence of what the cross is intended to do in a believer's life. Its focus is on what form does my life take? And of course, this centers entirely around Jesus's words of denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus. It's learning to know what parts of who we've been made to be is Jesus here to restore. And it is inviting us to consider that potentially crucifying those desires, crucifying those fleshly passions, crucifying ourselves to the world and the world to us is the way that we are going to bring about new life in the kingdom. This, of course, I've talked about for months and months and months on this podcast. Uh, The book of Revelation in its entirety, in my view, is one constant exhortation to the church to embrace both the source and the shape of their salvation rooted in a lamb on a cross, not a beast from a magnificent throne conquering via slaying his enemies. But what I am trying to wrestle with now is practically... And from person to person, what does this look like? What did it look like in Paul's life? What does it look like in the churches to whom he writes? What does it look like in their life? What does it look like in my life? What does it look like in your life? And in recent weeks, I've come across several articles. I don't know if this is a a new thing up and coming or if the algorithms are just pumping the same kind of articles my way online. Uh, Both are possible, I guess. But recent articles about the heresy 
of bad ethics. And Christianity Today has one of these. There are several others, and their their, their titles and and uh, publications are are I'm blanking on them at the moment. But people who are saying for so long we have called heretics simply people who are believing or who are teaching the wrong doctrines. And yet, what these authors are offering is that people also need to be considered heretics who are not living in the right way. And what is coming to mind, I think, is probably what many of you may know about is a new podcast by Christianity Today. It's currently coming out, uh, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, and it is looking at the life of Mark Driscoll. It is raising questions in the evangelical world about leaders who are oppressive or domineering in the negative sense or who are abusive in their kind of leadership, but get a hall pass by many in their camps because, well, they're teaching good theology. They're teaching from the Bible. They're teaching these true things, even though their demeanor and their character and the ways in which they go about teaching and leading and preaching and whatever else they do are corrupt. They're broken. They're misguided. And for Jesus, and I think for Paul later, to so connect the source of our salvation and the shape of it by the way we live as individuals and as communities, by connecting those things so tightly, by Jesus calling himself both the truth and the way, right, as he does in John 14, seems to indicate that several of these authors are onto something. When are we going to start calling out people for bad ethics, not just bad doctrine. And when are we going to point out people who, yeah, maybe their doctrine isn't exactly what you thought it should be, but their lives are in ship shape. Now that's a different world for me. I I grew up very much thinking if you don't believe the right things, then you're not going, um, you know, you're not heading in the right direction with Jesus and you're going to end up somewhere maybe apart from him. But the more I study scripture the more I see, I want to be particularly sensitive to the fact that as I understand scripture, I have certain doctrines that I choose to believe. But those doctrines are not given to me as a theology book. The the New Testament is not a theology workbook. Paul, Paul is not creating a systematic theology when he writes to the church in Rome. It's not Paul's magnum opus of his greatest theological achievement. Paul is writing two Christians who live in Rome, and he's explaining to them how the gospel of the kingdom is meant to reshape the world and therefore is meant to very specifically and concretely reshape the life they are living as a church in Rome. See, Paul's writings are all about pastoral theology. They're all about how do I take these concepts and apply them specifically to people in these particular situations. And so one of the things I've been leaning into more and more with our church is taking the teachings that Jesus is giving to us in the gospels and applying them in concrete ways to the difficulties and the challenges that we face as a shared ministry. And I'm finding that his teaching is landing with people. People are visibly and physically affected by the truth when we can apply it in concrete, specific ways, not just in the realm of I'm here to preach justification by faith and you need to just say amen because I'm preaching this beautiful doctrine. That's not what Paul does. And I'm, I'm a little bit upset, I guess, at the idea that for so long that can just happen in churches. We can just, well, our church just preaches the gospel. Our church just preaches the truth. And yet the way some people live and the way some people act out what they say they believe is not as consistent with the beauty of those beliefs as it should be. And so that's what I want to lean into a little bit in the podcast. I don't have a specific theme. I'm sorry, I do have a specific theme. It's going to be the source and the shape of our salvation. But I want to look at several passages. I have quite a few in mind that I'd like us to explore some things that um, I've, I've discovered there that I think is consistent with this idea of what it means to follow Jesus. Some things that I think Paul is teaching us 
I have several book interviews, two of which I've already done. One of them is to invite Tim Gombas back on the podcast for his new book, which is dealing a lot with this concept and how it relates to pastors in church ministry. I want to share with you a couple of sermons that I've preached to our shared ministry in the last four, five, six months that I think also get at this point and tie it into political realities and tie it into our life as a church. And I know you aren't members of our church, but I want you, as I've always wanted on this podcast, is to take what we are learning and discussing and and leaning into, and I want you to hear at least my attempt to make that practical, relevant, and tangible in the life of real people. That's always a goal of mine. Um, It is very hard to do. It is not an easy thing for me. I I am not a good applier of scripture. I, I feel comfortable in the realm of ideas. And so I am always seeking to grow in that way because I know that is a weakness of mine. Um, is a very powerful and effective teacher and preacher who can take the ideas and the themes and then hand it to someone in the practical, concrete world. And I do always aspire to be someone who can do that. So in the weeks and months to come, be looking for some of these sermons dropped in. Uh, like I said, I've got a couple book interviews. I've got a few that I'm hoping to get lined up, books that I'm working on right now. Um, I may even have a time in the future where I just share with you, here are the books that I'm reading. Here are the things I'm pondering that I'm not yet ready to speak on because I'm still processing them. And uh, maybe you're like me. I'd love to hear that. Personality-wise, how, what, how, what you're learning about yourself, how you've come to certain conclusions about yourself, um, it's exciting to me because this is a whole new world that has recently opened up And my wife and I are finding a lot of life in it. Um, We both think that she's a one. And so we have very differing approaches to the world and yet some that complement one another really, really well. And so I'm excited. I'm excited to get back in to studying scriptures with you. I'm excited to elevate Jesus in the place that he needs to be. And I do believe more and more that we are elevating Jesus when we come to understand the people he's made us specifically to be, and we live out of that identity, those strengths, that gifting, and we invite the Holy Spirit specifically into the parts of our personality and our makeup that are weak and that are driven by fear and that are anxious, and to have the Spirit investigate our motives. As David says, search me and know me and see if there is any any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, it is, it is, I think, um, and, and I simply disagree with those who don't like personality, but the reason why I do is because personality study is an incredibly wide door. It's a huge open door for us to explore the things, the tendencies and the motives that typically shape the way we act, react, make decisions and interact with the world. And the more of that that we know and understand, the clearer we will see where the Holy Spirit will choose to do his most powerful work. Because when the Holy Spirit brings comfort and brings help into our lives, most likely it's going to come in those kinds of areas where we see that we are weak. If we don't know those areas, we won't see the Holy Spirit at work giving us the courage to step up and to assert ourselves where we need to. Or we won't see the Holy Spirit say, yeah, I love asserting myself. That comes easy to me. Taking my time and listening to someone else and receiving their perspective, that's a challenge for me. And the Holy Holy Spirit would say, I know it is. So let's lean into that together. And this is why personality is so much fun to me. It's just the unique calling of each individual's life to pursue Jesus as he's made you. And he is forming us more into his image. And he is forming our entire church with all of its various makeups of giftings and strengths and weaknesses and needs into a perfect representation of what Jesus Christ would look like if his body took on community form. And so that's what I want to lean into. I'm excited for you to tune back in. I'm thankful for those who have just waited 
And I know I've probably lost some, but you can recommend this to a friend if you think they would be encouraged by it or find an old episode that's something that meant something to you and please share it with someone. Again, I'd I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear ideas you have or thoughts you have or things you're learning about yourself in terms of personality and pursuing Jesus and how this works in terms of knowing yourself and then being able to deny that self. And I would say David Benner in his book, um, The Gift of Being Yourself, did actually offer me a tremendous insight, and I'll leave you with this. And that is, as he said, we have to know ourselves in order to be able to deny ourselves. If we don't have a self to deny, there's nothing to do with Jesus' statement. Now, that's a paraphrase. But what David Benner means, I believe, is leaning into who you actually are and knowing who you are is a necessary prerequisite to being able to deny that because you can't deny what you don't have. So I do think that I had a lot of learning to do and still do because I'm still learning about what it means to be a healthy version of me. And then along the way, I want to see the parts of me that I've grown comfortable with complacent with or have adopted an attitude of, hey, you just need to deal with this because this is how I am. Oh no, there are beautiful aspects to every personality that exists that can be blessings to the world. And in this fallen world in which we live, we've managed to cope with the weak sides of those things or to overstep boundaries with those things or to not set up boundaries at all. And we have made a corruption of God's good world. And so coming to understand yourself, your heart motivations, and why you do what you do is is incredibly important to being able to then trust Jesus to faithfully lead us and to carry us along the way. So again, I'm so glad you're tuning in. I'm excited. Um, Each week, we're going to talk about something new, but it's probably going to center a lot around the source and the shape of our salvation as we learn to follow Jesus via the way of the cross. That's all for this week. Talk to you next time.